Servus. Malhaba. Hola. Hola. I'm inspired that there's so many people working to accomplish the same goal of creating a connected future. By having students lead clubs on campus directly supported by Google developers, that's the best way to reach out to students. It's really inspirational always to hear about members of the community who echo your values and echo your beliefs. I've been listening more than I've been speaking and I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing because I'm, I'm just getting all these ideas. Google, it needs to reach a wider audience and be more relatable as a company and I think Google is one of the brands that is very good at doing that. Hello everyone. Hello. Um, thanks, thanks for joining us. Um, this is going to be the first session in a three series of events um, of data structures and algorithms. I'm very excited to be hosting this together with Alexander, uh, tech lead from Conestoga DSC. We'll talk a bit more about ourselves as we go through the session. Uh, I see there's a lot of people in the chat. I'm pretty excited that like a lot of people are joining from different locations and even though it's like nighttime at somebody's somebody's place, you're still kind of uh, involved in joining these sessions. So thanks, thanks you all for, for joining us. Um, a few housekeeping things before we jump into the presentation. So if at all during the session you have any questions, please post them in the YouTube chat. Also, a good place to look at in is also our Discord server. So we have a think outside the value Discord server with a separate chat for data structures and algorithms. If you have some questions, something is not clear during the session, after the session, both me and Alexander will kind of go into there, um, answer any any of the pending inquiries that you have. Um, yeah, feel, feel free to drop by and we'll we'll figure stuff out. You can DM us or just we'll we'll talk about it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we you should have the Discord link in the chat. And basically, I don't want to take too much time. We have a lot of things to go through. Today is just like an introduction section. Uh, we will cover big O notation. We will cover some generic um, data structures that any programmer probably should know and have in their tool set, uh, or like a knowledge set, I would rather say. Um, and yeah, I, I don't want to take too much time rambling, so maybe we can go straight into the slides and talk about it a bit more. Cool. So, yeah, probably like a brief intro. So, thank you, Andre, for a brief <laughs> introduction. And uh, so, yeah, as Andre said, uh, it will be just an uh, introduction of data structures and algorithms. Um, and uh, firstly, we want to introduce ourselves. So my name is Alexander. I'm a Conestoga DSC tech lead. Um, I have joined the club recently, and it's like my first session, so I'm very excited to host it. And I hope you will enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, I try. I will try to make it as engaging as possible. So, yeah, enjoy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, my name is Andrew. I'm a Conestoga DSC lead. Um, we've I think you, you might have seen me in the past in the Firebase series. By the way, if you haven't seen that, definitely check it out. So some great events that we hosted over the last couple of months. Uh, and yeah, I'm very excited to be hosting this as well. And we'll go, we'll have both like technical discussions and like coding discussions. That's going to be great, I think. Okay, cool. So let's just probably do talk about event series itself. So this is not just one session. It's actually a whole event series dedicated to algorithms and data structures. So you're on the first uh, session. It is uh, just general overview of uh, data structures and algorithms. Um, next session, which will be exactly in one week, we will talk about common sorting algorithms. 
We will compare them, find out the most efficient ones, write some code, yeah, and do some fun stuff. Um, and the last session will be dedicated to graphs, pathfinding, and graph tra tra traversal. Sorry. Um, and again, we will have some code and exercises, code review, uh, some just general quizzes. So you will enjoy. <laughs> um, as uh, an agenda for today, it will be so intros. First tab, we'll talk about big O notation, so what it is, general purpose of it. Uh, then we will, we'll cover basic uh, data structures like stacks and queues. Um, go, we will go over sample app operations, uh, what they what they are, and just where. Also, we'll find out where you can apply them. And later, we will talk about trees and graphs as well. And finally, we'll have just a Q&A session where you will be able to ask all the questions you, you would like to. And so that's it. Andrew, do you have anything to add? No, I think. Uh, so this is like a high level of what we'll be covering. Although if you have questions about other topics that interest you, maybe there are some other data structures that you want to learn more about, definitely like ask away in the chat, ask away in, on the Discord. We love to talk about these things. Um, yeah, let's let's just jump into it and kind of go over these topics. <laughs> OK, so the first thing we want to talk about is big O notation. And uh, I don't know what level you're at right now. Maybe you have heard what it is. Maybe you have not. But uh, I will assume you don't know what it is. So <laughs> I will just explain everything from zero. Um, essentially, Big O is uh, a descriptor that allows you to assess how efficient your code is. So it's very important uh, just for technical interviews, just for your career as a programmer to write efficient and uh, to, to write efficient code. So. Here, yeah, so this first section is dedicated to Big O generally. So let's just dive into it. So here we will talk about, like, we will explain what, what a Big O is, what are the purpose of Big O. We will later, we will simplify Big O expressions and we will measure um, time and space complexities as well. I prepared some exercises so you also will be able to follow along. Um, and finally, we will just understand what the difference between time and space complexities and talk about each one. Um, so then, probably, as I said earlier, uh, Big O allows you to describe the efficiency of your code. So it's very important to, to have a specific vocabulary to describe your code, right? So you don't want to say, like on a technical interview or speaking with your colleagues, like, oh, this code is bad, oh, this code is, uh, code is good. You want to use some specific words, like technical vocabulary, that will help you to describe your code efficiency. So this is what a big O is for. Um, also, uh, there are many different solutions to, there can be many different solutions for one problem. And uh, sometimes, like for instance, you have 10 solutions, but you need to find out the most efficient one. Um, and the big O helps you to do that. Um, and again, we will also learn how to assess this um, time, time and space complexities. And later you will be able to find out the best solution uh, out of, uh, others that you may have. So also Big O is, can be used to describe different trade-offs. Again, if you want to compare different solutions, so you would say, OK, this solution is better, like it's faster, but it consumes more memory. But this solution um, uses less memory, but it's slower, right? So a Big O also will help you to do that. Um, there are some math concepts uh, involved in Big O, but we will not uh, talk about them a lot. Um, and during this session, you probably will be able to read it uh, um, from different resources. Um, it's just like 
again, high level overview to give you an idea to get you started. Um, because like generally data structures and algorithms, it's a very exciting topic. And I hope um, it, this will be a good start for you to dive into it. So, and probably the last thing I want to mention about Vigo is that Again, it's very important for interviews like in big companies like Google, right? So for instance, I don't know if you've watched some Google prep interviews or just uh, mock interviews. Um, they ask you like write a solution with this specific time complexity and with this specific space complexity. Or after you wrote the solution, they might ask you to assess these complexities after you're done. So again, this is very important. Um, so now let's just try uh, to go over one example so it's easier for you to understand. So imagine, so this is an example and imagine you need to write a function to calculate the sum of all integers from one to n inclusively. So here is a very, probably this is the solution you thought about, like the first one, right? So you just have an ordinary for loop, like you have a function which accepts uh, one parameter and then you declare a variable called sum and then you just uh, have one for loop which iterates from one to n, so to a specific number you want. To, and then essentially that way you calculate the sum, right? But uh, actually, if you think about it more, there is another more, like, probably better. I don't know. We'll talk about it uh, and uh, we'll explain why better or worse solution. So there is another solution. It's just one line, essentially. And um, there is actually a specific formula to do, to do this task. So just n multiplied n plus, n, uh, sorry. So just n multiplied by n plus one divided by two. So it's very simple. And uh, again, probably you think that solution on the right side is more efficient, but again, you need some technical language to explain why, right? So you again, on the interview or just talking with your colleagues or I know group mates, you don't want just to say, oh, this is good, this is bad. You want to use some specific uh, terms. So, now let's just think, before we measure anything, let's just think what are the possible ways to measure the time complexity, right? So how, how can we measure um, the, how good your code is? So probably the first solution you may think of is just uh, you know to run the function and then to track how many seconds it takes to run a specific function. Um, this is, uh, this, approach is not reliable because different machines record different times, right? So for instance, I don't know, on Mac, you will have this time, on Windows, you will have another one. So it really, yeah, again, it's not reliable. You cannot um, rely on it. Then, um, so this would be the first approach and we just talked about it, bad, <laughs> let's just, uh, jump to the next one. The next one, what we can do alternatively is to count the number of operations. So as you can see, each of these functions, they have like a lot of operations involved, right? So what we can actually do instead of tracking the time, so how long it takes to run the function, we can just calcu calculate the number of operations involved in a specific function. So let's just start with one on the right. And um, so we have one multiplication, right? We have one uh, addition and one division. So eventually we come up um, that we calculated that we have just three operations. And um, later we calculate that time complexity is of three because we have three operations, and it can be simplified to of one, which is called constant time complexity. We will talk about simplification, so big O expressions a bit later, so don't worry about it right now. It's just like high level over you. Um, then let's try to assess the function on the right. 
So we have the first operation. It's an assignment. So we say sum equals one, uh, equals zero. Uh, we have another assignment. We say i equals one. Then we have n additions and n assignments. So let's just, um, I don't know, maybe it can be confusing for you, but uh, actually this loop iterates n times. So whatever you put as a parameter in this function, so imagine you put 10, then this loop would, will iterate 10 times. If you put uh, 1 million as a parameter, um, then this loop will iterate 1 million times, right? So this, the, um, this loop depends on the parameter you enter. So we can conclude that we will have n additions and n assignments. So actually it depends on the number, like on the parameter you put in. Then uh, the same thing here, we have n additions and n assignments. Um, and then we have n comparisons. So we conclude that we have 5n plus 2 operations involved. And uh, again, we time complexity is of uh, 5n plus 2, and it can be simplified to open. So just, uh, just focus on the time complexity right now. So we have of 1 and of n. Uh, later, we'll have a graph, so you will be able to visualize it. But uh, now we have a specific, like we have reasoning, right? We have a specific reason why the right solution is more efficient than the left one. So the reason is because time complexity is better. Um, the right solution, time complexity is better. So it takes, it is faster to run it. Um, okay, I hope I didn't scare you with that and you didn't fall asleep, <laughs> but uh, um, let's just... So, yeah. sorry, sorry to stop you. Uh, we have a great, great question actually, yeah. uh, and maybe that will kind of explain um, the number of operations a bit better. So Steve is asking if the return statement counts at all and like if, if that is an operation that we need to count. Uh, do you mean it is return? Um, yeah, if return sum is like another one. And I guess mm -hmm. like even even if it does, right? Like if, even if we count that as an operation, that would mean it's 5n plus 3. And later mm -hmm. on, we will kind of go over simplifications of big O notation. And yeah. it will still be O of n, right? Yeah, actually, thank you so much for this question because I forgot to mention. Um, yeah, I forgot about this note. Um, like the reason why we want to at the bottom, you can see that I simplified it too often. Again, we will talk about simplifying big O expressions later. Um, yeah, next slide, it will be simplification uh, of big O expressions. But for now, like counting every single operation in your function is very tedious and time consuming, right? So imagine you have 300 lines of code and uh, you don't want to count every single operation. So that's the reason why we just want like high level over you, just a general trend. So again, do not be very focused on the counting every single operation right now. Later we'll have exercises and I believe you will be good with it later. So let's just jump uh, into simplifying big O expressions. Uh, yeah, and thank you so much for the question. Um, so here we have like simplifying big O expressions, as uh, I just mentioned, we need to care about the big picture. Again, counting every single operation is very tedious, very time consuming. You don't want to do this. So uh, you just need to care about the big picture overview of your code. Um, and this is actually why uh, we simplify big O expressions. So, there are two, rule, two rules that I will cover in this presentation. So the rule number one is constants do not matter. So for instance, imagine you have all of 20. Uh, so you just ignore it, like you ignore a constant and you just say all of one. So every constant will be one. So you replace every constant with one. Uh, so next example is all of 10 n, and we simplify it to all of n. Uh, essentially, like, again, you just replace 10 with one and one multiplied by n will be n. So we have often eventually. Uh, and the last example 
we have 18 multiplied by n squared. And again, we replace constant, which is 18, with 1. And it will be 1 multiplied by n squared. And we end up with all n squared, right? Uh, so I hope it's not complicated and you just <laughs> you understood it. So let's just uh, go to the second rule. So the second rule, we keep, uh, keep uh, the biggest term only. So what I mean by that is, so here, for instance, in this example, we have of n plus 20, and we simplify it to all of n. So we keep the biggest term. So what it means, we keep the n with the biggest um, power, right? So if we look at this example, for instance, we have of 8n squared plus 1. And again, do not forget about the previous rule, right? We replace all constants with ones. So it will be, again, we keep the biggest term. In this case, it will be 8n squared. And then we will just replace constant, which is 8, with 1. So 1 multiplied by n squared is of n squared. Um, the next example, again, keep n with the highest power. So essentially, we have this expression. We keep just 5n squared. And then uh, recall the previous rule. We replace constant 5 with 1. And it will be 1 multiplied by n squared, which is n squared. OK, so these are actually just uh, the rules. <laughs> uh, so just two rules. Uh, they're not hard. Now I hope you can understand why uh, I made this simplification. So why 5n plus 2 is n and 3 is 1. Um, well, um, just, just to stop you for one second, uh, we have a very good question. So <clears throat> Mohammed is asking, why do constants not matter in these expressions? And it's kind of like, it might also seem like magic. Why do we write equal signs like that, right? Like, why does O of n plus uh, 8n equals O of n, right? Like, why do we just make the constants disappear? Um, you can you can speak to that, Alexander, separately. But like from my experience, I know that there is some very interesting math behind it. Like if you want to learn more more how Big O works, like if you want like hard proofs of how Big O works, uh, there is multiple articles you can find online. We're just like our goal here is just to explain you in simple words how to calculate the complexity of a given algorithm and give you a Big O notation of that algorithm, right? So um, just for now, I like a good example for me is to imagine that n in all of these cases is a very, very big number. If n will be something like 10,000, then 10,000 squared will outnumber the, like you don't really care if it's like 80 million or 1 million, right? Like that, that change is not like not too significant. Or if it's like, 80 Google or one Google, right? Like it's, it. yes, 80 Google is much bigger. It's 80 times bigger, but on the significance of N, it doesn't really matter that much. Like all we care about is this N variable that comes in and we we want to look at the powers of N and like um, to get, get the biggest power and not track the constants with it. We'll look at how like different functions grow and why does like I'm using this doesn't matter word, but we actually will look at like how different functions grow and uh, the speed at which they grow. So it will be more. Um, I hope it's going to be more understandable as we explain it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, a good point. Thank you uh, for asking um, and for answering. Uh, so. Yeah, just as Andre said, we care just about the big picture. Um, we will actually, at the end of this big O section, we will have a graph. And uh, I hope it will clarify uh, like this moment why we ignore constants. Uh, so yeah, as Andre said, we just, uh, again, if N is a huge number, like this constant, it like really doesn't play too much um, in our like efficiency, right? And so um, again, we'll have a graph, and I hope it will, will clarify it a little bit. Um, just um, 
right now before now I we have a couple of exercises, uh, a couple of functions. Uh, so you can measure it, like practice uh, measuring big O. Um, again, we do not, um, I will I will explain. So every example I will explain and I hope uh, it will be clear, but uh, just some general trends uh, be before we start measuring big O. So every assignment, every operation like multiplication, um, addition, division, etc., cetera, uh, is essentially constant time, so of, of one. And also, if you want to access, for instance, an, uh, an element in the array, um, it, it's also a constant time. So it doesn't require, essentially, any, any time to do that. Uh, it means it's almost instant. Um, so now let's jump into measuring our big O. Um, so we have a simple function. It involves um, just one loop. And we have, uh, again, a parameter n. And uh, this loop iterates n times, right? So again, we had an example before. And we counted the each single operation. But again, since it's very time consuming, we just need to care about the big picture. Here, to measure a big O, you essentially need uh, to understand how, how many times this loop runs. So for instance, in this case, it will be n times, right? So depending on the parameter passed, um, the loop will iterate the same number of times. So again, if it's five, five times, if it's 10, 10 times, et cetera, et cetera. So we can conclude that this loop iterates n times, and thus we, uh, we have time complexity of, of n, right? So I hope it was at least somehow clear. So again, do not count every single operation, just understand how how much time essentially um, measure the complexity of the loop, okay? So if it iterates n times, then it will be all n. If it iterate, if uh, later we will have, so now we, we have this example. For, um, we don't have any parameter and we also have a for loop. So it iterates 10, ten times, no matter what happens. So like no, um, it, like it cannot be affected uh, unless you change uh, the value there. So this loop iterates 10 times always, no matter what. So thus it will be constant time. So of one, essentially, again, you can think of it as uh, since this loop iterates 10 times, we can say it will be of 10. But again, since we had the rules, recall the rules, uh, before um, that are introduced before. So yeah, we ignore constants. So of 10 equals of one. So essentially it means constant uh, constant time. Then we have another example. Again, we have function. So before, before, before we go into this example, uh, there was a nice question um, from, uh, yeah, so from Safunva. So they're asking if if you're given a coding problem as a standard to measure big O or only if asked. Uh, I think we kind of went over this, so I won't spend too much time on this question. But um, I think um, it's very nice, always nice to know the complexity of the algorithm that you're writing. And like during coding interviews, it's a very, very common question that the interviewer might ask you like, OK, so you have this solution. Uh, why is it better or worse than mine solution? Or like, what is the complexity of your solution? How we can improve it? What complexity, complexity can we achieve? And what they expect in the return is you would give them like a big O notation of what the complexity is. Is it O of N, O of N log N, uh, O of N squared and things like that. But yeah, thank, thanks for the question. True. Um, so let's just uh, go back to the example. So here we have two nested loops. 
right? So, and again, we have one parameter that is passed in there and uh, it's n. So the first loop, probably you can conclude looking at the code that the first loop will iterate n times and the inner loop will iterate n times as well. So there is actually one rule if uh, there is one rule to measure big O time complexity if you have nested loops. Again, um, it will be the number of times the outer loop iterates multiplied by the number of times the inner loop iterates. So since we have, since here we have a nested loop, we, and we concluded that the outer loop iterates n times and the inner loop iterates n times as well. Um, we just do all, it will be O of n multiplied by n and which is equal to O of n squared. So again, just um, as a recap, essentially pay attention to loops <laughs> uh, when you measure big O generally. Um, and you need to understand how many times these loop iterate. Again, do not count every single operation. Uh, just uh, be very careful with uh, how many times each single loop iterates. And again, if we have nested loop, then we then we multiply the number of times the outer loop iterates multiplied by the times inner loop iterates. So, okay. So now going back to the question why we ignore constants. <laughs> uh, here we have a chart like uh, just a graph. Um, and it just shows the different time complexities, okay? Um, and uh, so different, essentially just a big O complexity chart. Yeah, you can see it here. Um, we talked about of one, which is there in the green area. Then we talked about uh, O of n, which is yellow. And we talked about O of n squared, which is red. And um, this, like just uh, again, this is very descriptive chart. So uh, you can probably, um, you probably thought that uh, uh, the bigger time complexity, uh, the worse the solution is. So again, if it's off one, it means uh, the solution is perfect. If it's uh, off n squared, the solution is not so good. So you probably can improve it. Um, so as you can see here, on the on the chart, if we like we'll take for instance uh, all fan, so which is in yellow, and uh, all fan squared. Like to be honest, like these constants again, they do not play a big role in um, in the in these lines, right? So it doesn't matter what constant you put there. Uh, still, the general trend is the same. And this is what we care about. So again, we just uh, need a high level. Uh, let me formulate it correctly. Um, we just care about general trend. Again, constants do not matter because they do not influence essentially um, anything. <laughs> so, and that's that's it. So, uh, I don't. I hope it answers your question again. We care about general trend, so don't worry about constants. Yeah, um, I think I think this graph also pre like it it shows pretty nicely like why let's say you have all of um, n squared plus n. Let's say you have like a double for loop and then a single for loop, right? Like that that would be end up as n squared plus n. Uh, so yeah. all of that expression would be just all of n squared. The reason for that is because all of n squared grows much, much faster, and you can see this from this graph, than all of n. Like even though they're both like terms in the expression, we only care about the biggest one. We, we basically care about what will Im impact our expression the most, and that's why we take all of n squared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct, true. Uh, so you probably also may have questioned what a logarithm is. So here, for instance, you can see n log log n. So 
during this session, we will not talk about it. Uh, the next session will be dedicated to sorting algorithms and some efficient sorting algorithms uh, have n log of n um, time complexity. So yeah, we will talk about it uh, in the future sessions. But uh, for now, you just need to, again, to understand the rules, um, like generally how to measure the big O. Um, and again, it's important. Why? Because you may be asked about it during the interview. Uh, you want to assess your code and understand why this solution is better than that one. Okay. So these are the main reasons why you need big O, essentially. Um, so now let's talk about space complexity briefly. So everything what we talked before, it was about time complexity. So time complexity, it means how long does it take to execute a function? So like how long do you need to execute this function, right? But space complexity is how much memory do we need to allocate to execute a specific function? So these are like a little bit different terms, but again, you measure both of them using big O, okay? So as if we go back like in this slide, we say time complexity of this function is O of n squared, right? Um, and later, like right now, we will learn how to measure space complexity, and then you will be able to assess both time and space complexity using the big O. Okay, so before we learn how to measure uh, the space complexity, let's just uh, take a look at the general trend. So again, space complexity is how much memory do we need to allocate somewhere uh, to execute a specific function. So here, as you can see, primitives like integers, booleans, chars, uh, like doubles, et cetera, uh, they are constant space. So it means of one. So all of them are constant. If we have arrays or strings, um, most of the time they are of n. Uh, why, you may ask why strings are of n, because essentially strings are arrays of characters, right? So that is the reason why strings are um, all fan as well. So let's just, uh, I know it may be confusing for now, but let's just uh, take a look at the example. So here we have uh, a function. It's like the same functions as uh, from the previous exercises, but just now, again, we measure not time complexity. So no, not how long it will take to execute this function, we measure how much memory do we need to execute this function? So in this case, we have just one variable, which is i, and we have just one assignment, right? So we say we create variable i and assign it to zero initially. Um, and thus, looking at this general trend, we can see that since i, is like, in this case, it is an integer. Um, we can conclude that it just like, it's a primitive data type. And uh, this is the reason why we need just all fan space to execute, execute this function, uh, off one space to execute this function. So essentially just constant. Um, again, I hope it's clear. Let's just move uh, to the next function again. We have almost the same one. If you recall, um, this function with the for loop where which iterates n times, the time complexity is of n, but the space complexity is of one. In this case, we concluded that the time complexity it is of one. Why? Because no matter what happens. This loop iterates 10 times. But again, right now we focus just on the space complexity. So how much memory we need to allocate in order to execute this function. And it is, again, 
to assess it, to, um, to understand it, we need to see how many variables we declare. So in this case, we have just one variable and one assignment. So again, we can conclude that we uh, the space complexity is just of one. So now you will be able to say that the time complexity is of n uh, of one. Why? Because no matter what happens, this loop iterates ten times. But space complexity is also yeah. But, and space complexity is also of one. Why? Because we just need one variable to to store um, i, and that's it. Now let's take a look at uh, a little bit <laughs> um, harder example. So here we have another function which accepts a, um, an array. And we have, um, yeah, and essentially what this function does, it just duplicates an array. Um, so on line two, we create a variable called new array and we store, uh, we create a new array with the same length as uh, the one given to us, right? So here. Now think about array in this way. Array is uh, essentially a collection of different, uh, just a collection of variables. So to store an array, you just need to allocate many, many different spots in the memory to store specific values, right? So in this case, since we have, uh, and also think about array length as n. So imagine you have an array given to us, and then array length is n. So thus, you can conclude we need to allocate n data points in the memory to store this array, right? If we think as uh, array.length is n. Um, OK, let me probably reiterate it um, from scratch. This function, it duplicates an array. So it accepts one array. And imagine, like, think of it, that array.length is n. And since array is a collection of variables, we just need to allocate n different variables in the memory. And uh, hence, we can come up to the conclusion. Uh, we, we can conclude that the space complexity is of n. So Andre, if you want to add something, and maybe uh, from your words, it will be better, like it, it, you will be able to explain it better so other people can no, hear no, your I think, version. I think it's pretty clear. Um, sorry, I was kind of answering the questions in parallel. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think the, the, the general idea is that, yeah, like you just want to look at how much memory, how much like uh, bits of memory are used by your program, right? Like uh, if it's an array, how much, uh, what does your length of the array depend upon? If it depends on n, then here you go, it's O of n, um, things like that. But if you just have one variable, as we've shown in the previous examples, that's O of one respectively. Um, yeah, and like just also as a general rule, like you might be asked about space complexity. It's uh, less common that people ask that because there was a great question as well about which one is more important, which one do you want to look at, the space complexity or time complexity. Uh, I think it really depends on your use case. Like maybe you're going for a program that will um, probably take like as little space as possible. Uh, then you probably want to orient into that. Or if you're going for the faster solution, you want to prefer this, the time complexity. You need to decide for yourself. But in my personal opinion, probably time complexity is more important because generally, especially nowadays, space is not that uh, problematic. And there's quite a few algorithms that will take, like, that, that you need to care about space um, anyway. Uh, yeah. Uh, also, let's let's kind of move on. We have a lot of things to cover still. Uh, we yeah. kind of like half half through the um, through our workshop. So um, thank you everybody for your questions. I've been chatting with people on on the chat as well. 
Um, we will go into data structures now, I believe. OK, cool. Uh, so again, yeah, as Andrew said, um, yeah, time complexity is uh, more asked during the interviews, right? So I can I can probably guarantee if you write a specific like if you're I don't know in a big tech company interview, uh, they definitely will ask you about time complexity and I believe space complexity as well. And again, you you probably want to balance between them. So you don't want to write a solution that takes a whole bunch of time, but uh, the space is good or vice versa. So yeah, you probably need to find that uh, uh, that perfect balance between them. Okay, so now, <laughs> finally, uh, let's talk about data structures, uh, like uh, what probably most of you want to talk about right now. Um, so again, data structures, very important. Uh, for writing efficient code. Um, and uh, what data structures are, are essentially different ways of storing data. So like different approaches to storing data, right? So there are many different types of uh, data structures like lists, stacks, queues, trees, graphs. And we will talk uh, about uh, stacks, queues, trees, trees, and graphs uh, more in detail. Um, so. The first data structure is a, a stack, right? So again, data structures are actually an abstract concept, right? So you you just need to understand it like different operations, and this is what I, I will describe right now. So stack is a data structure. Uh, uh, sorry, stack is a data structure that follows a LIFO principle. So what it means, it is a it, it is last in, first out. So think about a stack like a stack of plates, right? Or a deck of cards. So you do not take the bottom most plate. You take the plate uh, one on the top, right? And you put plate on the top, not, uh, you don't put it on the bottom, right? So essentially stack, like again, try to do an association it's like a stack of plates. Um, so again, and what this LIFO means, again, the last element in, it will be the first element out. Again, returning to this example with a stack of plates, think of it, we have a stack. You put the last plate you put in, it will be the first plate out. So it will be the first plate you take out, right? Um, so and here, we have like general uh, functions about um, for the stack and also uh, properties. So again, last in, first out, remember it always. Um, push, like, and, and there are three operations, push, pop, and peak. So push, it means like on the diagram um, on the right, you can probably see that push, it means to add an element, right? So right now, push, it means to add. And pop, it means to remove. So push again, add an element on the top. Pop, remove an element from the top. And that's it. Peak, it means the topmost element. So the one that is on top. And then the length is essentially the number of elements in the stack. So. Again, uh, right now, uh, we will not implement it um, like the stack. You probably can find uh, different tutorials. Like after this session, you can probably Google or maybe find some videos on YouTube. There are like different implementation tutorials. So how you can implement a stack. But uh, right now, one like you, you definitely have a question like, why do you want, like, why? Do you want to use data structures and stack in this case specifically? So the most common use case for a stack is uh, an undo operation. So here you can see a screenshot of a Google um, back and forth buttons. Um, so this is like a simple example where a stack can be applied, right? 
So undo operation. So what undo operation means, like uh, you just want to go back one action or two actions or three actions back. Um, so, and let's just uh, go over this example. So imagine you're on the web browser, like Google, and you type like Wikipedia. So what browser does, um, it tracks, like it has stack, stack somewhere behind the scenes that you can cannot see, obviously. Uh, and there it stores different pages, like different, let's say, URLs that you visited. So imagine, so now you click on the Wikipedia page. So what, let's say, browser does behind the scenes, it says, OK, now you visited Wikipedia. Then. Uh, imagine you click on the continents. So you search continents and then you click continents. So after you clicked on continents and you went and you go to the next page, the browser puts this URL in the stack. Okay. So then imagine you want, then next out of these uh, uh, out of uh, the continents list, you pick the North America, and you go to the North America page. So again, after you go to the North America page, what browser does, it puts this URL in the stack, again, behind the scenes. Um, and, uh, and later, imagine you go to Canada page, and then you go to Toronto page. So, and now, so browser ha has this stack, right? And if you want to click on the back button, so you click undo button, right? So what browser will do, it will redirect you. It will pop the topmost URL. In this case, it is Toronto. And it will move you to the Canada page. And then again, if you click back button again, so you undo, then it will pop the topmost element, which is Canada page from the stack and it will redirect you to the North America page. So I hope uh, this visualization like helped you to understand how stack can be applied in this particular case. So like, again, this is one of the most common use cases of the stack. So undo operation, if you want to go back. Uh, again, it's in different applications like Paint, uh, Photoshop, where you, like different um, applications have this functionality. So, and this is how it can be implemented. Um, okay, so the next use case can be manage the sequence of operations in the programs. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with the term call stack, but what call stack is, it's, it essentially tracks what uh, the order of the functions to execute, okay? So when you're, let's say compiler reads your program, it needs a specific sequence of the functions to call. So, and this is what the call stack is used for. So it tracks the sequence of functions to call. Um, and then the third use case is essentially in advanced algorithms. Again, um, when you, if you dive deep into different algorithms, you will understand that stack is used, uh, is very common in all of them. Just, so, a quick, just a quick question uh, we had from the chat. So um, uh, July is also asking, like, is, is control Z using a stack behind the scenes, right? Like your undo operation. That's actually the first use case that we covered, right? Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's basically the same idea with the, um, uh, with the back button on your browser or the forward button. Uh, mm -hmm. So you're like undo and redo operations that use stack exactly like they, they uh, the items that they stack, though, are different. Those are like operations in your text editor or your like whatever editor you are using. Uh, so it's like add a word, remove a word. That that operation is stored on the stack as like an item. Uh, but yes, behind the scenes, they are using a stack. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, so. Yeah, thank you for asking them. At least I know that uh, some people are um, involved in the presentation. Uh, so it's great. Thank you. So 
Now let's go to another data structure, uh, which is Q. Uh, generally speaking, stacks and queues are taught together, like very commonly, uh, like because they're very similar type of data structure. Uh, so they are both uh, linear and uh, essentially they follow most the same approach. So if we define what a queue is, so queue is a data structure that follows a FIFO principle. So what FIFO is uh, means it first in, first out. So again, queue is a queue, like line, right? So you are in a, in a queue for uh, for a coffee, right? Or I don't know, in a theater or somewhere else. And uh, this is like an ordinary queue, an ordinary line. So, and now think as uh, FIFO, what FIFO is. So the first person that comes in will be the first person served and the first person out, right? So one by one. And on the right side, you can see like uh, a visualization. So, uh, so the first, one is um, bright red, and it is the first one to be removed. So again, here we have basic operations, again, associated in your head. So stack is LIFO, so last in, first out, and Q is the first in, first out, okay? So now about specific operations um, and Q, it means to add an element. DQ, it means to remove an element from a queue. Peak, it means uh, the first element to be served. So the first element in the queue. And then length, again, the number of elements in the queue itself. Um, again, um, I hope it's not very complicated and it's intuitive because again, it's very relatable to the um, to our lives, right? So um, now let's talk about Q applications. Q applications, uh, well, uh, I didn't come up with a lot of them, but uh, like they are widely used, like they're ubiquities. Uh, here, like printer Q, like imagine printer, when you send, like when you want to print something, so imagine, like you are in a college or in a university and you want to, and different students want to print paper, right? Their, they, their paper to submit to a professor. So they sent a request to the printer and a printer has its own queue of different papers to print, right? So the first paper in will be the first paper to be printed out, right? So. That's essentially it. So it's. Uh, I hope it's not complicated and it's intuitive. Yeah. And when, uh, when, again, when, when we were, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. When we were talking about queues as well before the workshop, we were like, queues are used where you want to use a queue uh, because, like, like it's literally <laughs> if you, if you have a use case where uh, you want some like stacking of of things and then you want to release each job as it comes in, like the first job that comes in needs to be processed the first and come come out the first, like that's that's your use case. Uh, I'm sure like maybe there's people who have used queues already, like please drop in the chat the use case that you've, uh, you can think of. Uh, we would love to kind of see what you can come up with. Yeah. Right. Yeah, actually, you use queues when you need queues. <laughs> and that's it. Yeah, good point. <laughs> so, and again, just think about different applications like, I don't know, Tim Hortons or, uh, I don't know, just if you order something online, again, if, where you need a queue, where you need a line, you, you need a queue data structure. Um, okay, so the next data structure I want to talk about is a tree. Um, again, tree is intuitive, I would say. Uh, again, tree is like a tree. <laughs> you have, uh, so it's a data structure that consists of nodes with parent-child relationship. So I will explain it later, don't worry. And uh, there are actually different uh, types of trees, like a huge amount of them. We will just talk about them in, generally, uh, in general. Uh, so here, you 
can you see this article from Wikipedia? Uh, if we can just make uh, the font a bit bigger, that would be nice. Okay, yeah, great. thank you. So here, like these all are types of trees, tree data structure. Uh, to be honest, like uh, I know what binary trees are and I know what heaps are, but uh, yeah, some other stuff, I'm not sure what it means. So yeah, actually, like you see a lot of different types, but again, we will just focus on in general um, and we will talk about different uh, properties of a tree again in general. So you can, um, you can just go to this article, maybe on Wikipedia, just type um, tree data structure types. And uh, there you will see like this list and you can read about each of them individually. Um, so let's just go back. But again, here we just talk general overview of them. So very important uh, point to make, um, stacks and queues are linear data structure, as I mentioned earlier. So what it essentially means, everything goes one by one, right? So uh, in a stack and in a queue, you have one by one. But trees are non-linear. So what it means, uh, you don't have this one by one sequence. You have kind of um, different structure uh, of the tree, right? So it's uh, you have different branches and like it's not just one element after another one. So it's it's also important to remember. So again, stacks and queues are linear. Trees are non-linear. Um, and again, think of trees like trees <laughs> in, in real life. So uh, you have different branches. And uh, um, so yeah, let's just uh, talk about these uh, terms. Firstly, so here we have like node. What node means, it essentially is one uh, data point. So every circle in here is essentially a node, right? Um, then here, if we talk about root, so root, it is the top node in a tree. So the main node in the tree. So it is this one. In this case, in this tree, it is eight, okay? So the top node, very important to remember, every tree, no matter uh, you know, what type of belief, I'm not sure, but okay, generally, let's talk, uh, has one root, okay? So every tree has one root, and in this case, it is eight. Then we have uh, other terms, child and parent. So child and parent, um, again, it's like uh, ancestry tree. So you can think of it like this. So in, in this case, a child, so three is a parent of six and one, okay? So... Like I hope uh, again, it's uh, it's not hard. So uh, and now here, for instance, six is a parent of four and seven. Okay, and seven is a child of six, respectively. Okay, so it's just like parent-child relationship in real life, essentially. Um, then let me just erase it for a second. Uh, okay. Uh, then we have siblings. So siblings are uh, essentially group of nodes with the same parent. So if we take a look here, so one and six are siblings, right? Why, and and for um, no, fourteen is not. Uh, one and six are pair uh, are siblings. Why? Because they are on the same level and they are from the same parent. 14 is not the sibling of, uh, of the six. Why? Because they are not from the same parents. 14 comes from uh, from 10, right? So 14 does not have any siblings, okay? Um, again, I hope it makes sense. Uh, then leaf, it's a node with, um, again, just a second. Um, Leaf is a node with no children. So what it means, it just like kind of like the last node in a tree uh, in, in a branch, okay? So here we have 
One is a leaf. Why? Because it does not have any children. Four is a leaf. Why? Because it does not have any children. And again, seven and 13 are the leaves as well. Like in this case, 10 is not a leaf. Why? Because it has a child. Um, so again, very simple, very intuitive. And then edge is a connection between the nodes. So essentially these arrows are called edges, okay? So these lines, uh, lines that connect nodes are called edges. Okay, so this is just some general terminology. So you maybe if you read an article, you understand, okay, I know what a root is, I know what a sibling is, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Um, um, I think just, just to pause you for a second, we had a nice question. Um, so Amanda was asking if uh, three and four uh, are considered siblings of eight, uh, which, well, technically, like, they, they both, kind of share the same parent, Child. right? Like not, not, not directly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but like, I think usually when you talk about siblings, you talk about siblings of the same level. And I agree with Ranjit in the chat as well. Um, like you would usually talk about uh, direct parents and direct siblings. Um, however, like mm -hmm. there, there are other terms and there are different kinds of siblings that you might identify. Usually when somebody talks about siblings in a tree, they mean like the direct siblings on the same level, they share the same parents. So uh, four and three would not be siblings in this case. Yeah, it's correct. So again, how you identify levels, essentially you can just uh, draw these like lines to help you identify different levels. So this is first level, second level, third level, fourth level. So uh, in here, it's, it's basically how long will it take you to go to that node from the root of the tree, right? Like three and 10, it's only one step, one, six and 14, it's two steps and so on. Yeah. Um, so again, yeah, as Andre mentioned, uh, yeah, three and four are not the siblings. Uh, uh, like three and 10 are the siblings. Uh, again, why? Because they are on the same level, as you can see, and they share the same parent. Okay, so that that is essentially how you identify um, the siblings. If we so, talk generally about this tree, we don't have too many siblings in here. So siblings would be like one and six, then three and 10, and then four and seven, and that's it. So just three pairs. Yeah, uh, Boon had a great point actually like, three and four could be called descendants of eight. That's another term, yeah. which it means like any node that eventually, if you come up the tree will share the parents. So mm -hmm. like th four would be a descendant of eight because if you go up the tree, you will eventually hit eight um, on your path to the root. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's like a lot of terms and I, I like to think about this as family tree. Uh, mm -hmm. The terminology is al almost the same, right? Like parent, child relationship, siblings and things like that. Yeah, true. Yeah, great point. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, actually, like, again, to I want to mention it again. The This terminology, it's not everything. It's just, like, brief, very um, small overview of a tree, right? Obviously, if you learn about it more and you will encounter more specific terms, like, for instance, height of a tree and um, other different stuff, uh, but uh, again, we do not talk about it right now. We just uh, because we want uh, to give you just some the most common terms so you understand what each thing is. Yeah. Okay, great. So now let's switch to tree applications. So where can I use trees? <laughs> trees are very useful uh, data structure used. To, they are used everywhere. <laughs> Literally, like uh, you, you use them like every day when you when you do something on your computer. Uh, but uh, but you probably don't realize it. So the first application I mentioned here, it's like DOM. So HTML DOM, which stands for Document Object Model, uh, is essentially. Okay, just a second. Let me switch. Um, so here, if I go here. 
So every website um, has uh, like this of HTML, right? So an HTML DOM exploits tree. So and now you may ask how. Uh, so here, let think of each like uh, for, uh, how to say it. Um, let's elements, call it tag, tag elements. Yeah, yeah tag, tag, element. tag element. Okay. Uh, tag element as a node, and if you you actually can browse here and you see you can go deeper and deeper. So um, actually, like this HTML HTML DOM exploits tree. So this is a tree behind the scenes, right? But instead of storing numbers like uh, like here, for instance, on the slides, uh, just a second. Um, that, uh, Anyway, so yeah, instead of storing numbers, we store like tag elements, right? So this is essentially how HTML DOM works. Again, you can probably find a lot of articles uh, um, about DOM and uh, like how it's how it works online. So if you're interested in it, you can do your own research. Then uh, AI, again, AI exploits trees, uh, so think like probably so artificial intelligence tic tic toe game so it find it needs to find different ways to act so for instance i found this picture here um i don't know if you can see it okay anyways um is it big enough or no <laughs> Uh, it's fine. I don't know if you can make it bigger, but the general idea is there. Uh, I think it, yeah. Yeah, it is visible. Yeah. So essentially, again, you have kind of a tree data structure, uh, and it just AI. This is how is how AI works. Essentially, it just uh, exploits different ways. So it goes like it takes different steps. So okay, now it goes here, and then it goes here, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, and then it uh, exploits, yeah, it analyzes different ways um, as it acts. Okay, uh, so then folders and operating system. So, like, it doesn't matter what operating system you use, like, you literally, I would say, like Mac, right? Uh, uh, Windows, Linux, um, all of them use uh, Tree to, to store the folders, I would say. So different levels of folders, OK? So for instance, here you have my uh, this PC, right? And then you have uh, documents, and then you have uh, Visual Studio, and then you have templates, et cetera, et cetera. So again, you can think of these folders as nodes, OK? And then, for instance, uh, yeah, and then this is essentially how it works. Um, and here you, you can see this diagram. So imagine you have a folder called admin, and then it stores inside an in admin folder. You have desktop folder, documents folder, and downloads folder. Okay, and inside desktop folder you have work and school folders, and inside documents you have taxes. So essentially, it just um, how OS stores your folders, OK? So again, we can conclude here that uh, Tree is uh, widely used and probably even didn't think about it, but uh, you definitely use it in your life many times. Uh, so and the last point I mentioned here, it's like JSON. JSON is um, essentially a special format to store your data. So, and it also exploits um, tree data structure. Again, uh, if you want to read about it more, um, you can just Google it and read uh, different articles. Um, so, great. So I hope uh, tree is clear. And now let's switch to our last data structure for today, because I see we have just 15 minutes left. Um, so let's talk about graph. Uh, to be honest, I like graph a lot. Uh, it's very fa fun data structure to play with, and uh, just generally, again, it's uh, 
commonly used. Uh, we'll talk about its applications later. So graph. Graph, uh, very simple definition, like uh, is a set of nodes and connections. Um, and that's it. <laughs> and uh, also important to note, refer back stacks and queues are linear, graphs are nonlinear. So what it means, elements do not go one by one. They go in different, uh, let's say, chaotic order, OK? So as you can see here, graph, uh, a graph example on the right. So then you have like different types. So uh, weighted, unweighted, and then directed, undirected. So we'll have a couple of exercises so you can uh, understand uh, different types of trees. Uh, so here, again, basic terminology, vertex, ouch, sorry. I, it's a typo, <laughs> don't read it. <laughs> um, vertex, it essentially means um, a node, so it's a data point. Again, the definition there is not correct. Um, yep, just <laughs> don't read it. <laughs> and uh, here, so essentially, this is a vertex, uh, A is a vertex, B is a vertex, C is a vertex, so essentially, Every data point is a vertex. And then edge is uh, a connection, OK? So edge is a connection between vertices. Uh, again, very simple. You can find, I, I'm i sure you will find a lot of uh, different terminologies later. Uh, like if you research graphs in depth and you learn about them in depth. But uh, for now, uh, yeah, we'll keep it simple. Uh, refer going back to our types. So, why? So let's try. So now I have different uh, graph types, and let's analyze it and define uh, and define and sorry and define their types. So this one. So weighted and unweighted. So weighted, unweighted. It means uh, if an edge. So if, so again, an edge is this connection. If every edge in the graph, they have a weight, so like eight or five or uh, seven, um, it means the graph is weighted. But, uh, but again, every connection should have weight in this case. Uh, but uh, if you do not have weight, then it, uh, it is unweighted. Right, so again, very simple. Um, so in this case, this is unweighted graph. Why? Because it does not have any weights, uh, uh, like weight or on the eight edges. So you will see an example of a weighted graph later. Uh, then directed, undirected. Um, so it, it just means if you have a specific direction which you can use to move. So for instance, you can move from no, from vertex A to vertex B. Because why? Because uh, you have a specific direction here, right? So you can go this way, but you cannot go from B to A. Why? Because just one um, one direction is allowed, and uh, here the same. So B D, you can just go from D to B, not vice versa. Why? Because only one way. Uh, you can actually, sometimes you can have like two, uh, two directions, so it's also valid. Um, so and now we can conclude that this is directed graph. Why? Because it has directions. Uh, if uh, in later, so let's just go to the next slides. So again, analyze it. This, this um, graph has directions. OK, so specific uh, uh, way, again, directions to move um, that you need to follow. OK, so it means this is a directed graph. But this graph does not have any weight on the edges. So it means it is unweighted. So it is unweighted and directed graph. Uh, then um, go into this example, it is unweighted, why? Because we don't have any weight on the edges, and undirected graph, because we do not have any direction. So it means we can move both 
in both directions, A to B and B to A, right? Um, and then this example, you see now you have digit, so you have values, every edge has value, so a corresponding value. So for instance, which you can refer to as a cost, right? So for instance, uh, uh, to go from A to B, it takes A points, right? Or whatever you want to call it. So here, it will be the, this graph would be type of weighted. So we just weighted. Why? Because edges have weight and directed. Why? Because um, there are different directions. And uh, the last graph is um, weighted and undirected, probably as you ca can conclude. Why? Because you have weight on each, um, on each edge of the graph, and then you don't have any directions. So you can move in both ways. Okay. So, and um, let's just wrap it up with the uh, graph applications. Um, again, graphs are very widely used. Number one, Google Maps, right? So every city, every cafeteria, every location is a vertex. So let's imagine this is, I don't know, um, Toronto. This is uh, New York. So when do you and you so this is essentially how Google Map Maps work, but it, obviously in more detail. Um, so different locations are different vertices, so different nodes, and uh, in this way you essentially can uh, create maps and uh, find. Uh, like short test paths, right? So again, social networking. So the picture on the right, you have, so imagine you have a Facebook account and so this is you and you have many different friends, okay? So, and what Facebook does behind the scenes, it says, oh, this person has this, this and that connection, okay? So, and it creates different nodes, like different vertices and connects it, okay? So you are connected with uh, different, different people in this way, okay? So this is how Facebook stores your connections, okay? Uh, and uh, like, it's not just Facebook, it's every social media, I would say. Uh, the next uh, application is pathfinding. Again, Google Maps, find the shortest path from point A to point B. Um, and um, the last one, recommendation systems. So again, machine learning exploits graphs to like, for instance, on Netflix, if you watch, if uh, like you probably have seen, oh, we recommend you to watch this, this and that movie, right? YouTube, for instance, it, it doesn't give you random videos. It analyzes what you probably would like to watch and it gives it to you. So this where graphs can be applied like obviously it's not just graphs, it's many other concepts, but uh, graphs uh, are essential there as well. Um, and also one moment, uh, we will talk about uh, graphs more in depth uh, on the last series. So we will write uh, uh, on the rest, on the last session, I'm sorry. We will write some code and like implement graphs and uh, also do some, yeah, we will explain how pathfinding works uh, and it will be more in detail. So you, so you can understand. So, okay, I hope, this is the last slide. I know it took a while. Uh, then I hope uh, it was, you learned a lot. I hope you didn't fall asleep. <laughs> uh, and uh, thank you for, yeah, to people who asked uh, questions. Uh, it shows your engagement and that you listen. Um, and it's also important to, uh, and now let's just uh, wrap our session up with uh, with questions and uh, like your questions, right? So go ahead. Are there any yeah. questions? Um, like yeah, just thank you so much for the feedback. Uh, I, I really like seeing a lot of people like asking questions. I was answering a lot of them on the chat. 
uh, just really, really great engagement. And also, thank you, Alexander, for the, preparing this awesome session. This was primarily your um, uh, like your initiative, and I, I really think this is going to be a great, great series. Um, yes, anybody, if thanks, thanks everybody for for joining us. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, either ask them now. We still have like five minutes to hang out. Or you can go to our Discord server and also um, ask some questions after the session. If still something is unclear, uh, we are very happy to, to help you and figure stuff out together. Yeah, thank you so much. Great. Oh, we have, we have a, a nice one from Dimitri. Uh, if we can pull that up. Uh, so Dimitri is asking, what is the best website to learn and practice algorithms? Uh, I can name a few. Uh, I don't know if uh, Alexander, you, you, can, you can add anything you you know. Um, so um, the one that one that I learned a lot from was Code Forces. Uh, I'm probably gonna like compile a list of things and drop it in the chat for people interested. Um, so there is like a, a lot of websites where basically you submit code to solve some challenges uh, and it boosts both your programming knowledge and also your abstract thinking, your algorithms and data structures knowledge. Um, it's slipping my mind, but there is also another one. Um, Hack HackerRank is a very like popular one. Uh, I think like they have a, a great like section of uh, tutorials on different programming languages as well as um, different like uh, data structures and different kind of problems to just solve uh, in free time. Uh, another fun one, which is less of a um, less, less of a data structure algorithm thing, but um, it's more of like programming um, programming language practice is um, coding katas and exorcisms. Um, I'll drop all of those names that I'm like uh, saying right now, but um, yeah, lead code is another lead, one, another great code, one. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, there is tons of them. Just pick where chef chef code is uh, another one that I know. Uh, we'll probably compile a list of them, drop them both in the chat and the um, Discord. As for resources to learn things, um, I don't know, Alexander. Do you have anything from yeah, the top of your head? Uh, to be honest, like <laughs> internet, Google, just uh, YouTube, Basically. right? So different tutorials. You can just probably uh, find uh, something on YouTube. Just uh, type uh, data structures and algorithm, and you will have like introductory step by step. You know, uh, I mean, with implementation, essentially what we talked about right now, but more in detail. Um, and uh, yeah, pro like books about books, like the most famous one, probably Cracking the Code in Interview. Yeah, like you can also buy it later. Um, I think I think it's a good idea to compile like a list of um, resources to learn from. I think we'll, like later on, we'll have like a Git repository for you to check out, yeah. a GitHub repository. And we'll probably put that in the readme and also on our Discord service. I think that would be a good place to put it so all of you can reference those, those resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, and also, do not forget that this is just an introduction, right? We still have two sessions, and uh, they will be again. We will code there, so it's it will not be yeah. just a presentation. So it will be more engaging, I would say. Yeah. So hopefully you will enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, the so, next session. Uh, thanks for asking, Steve. Uh, the next session will be next Friday, exactly the same time. Yeah. Uh, we will be covering sorting algorithms. Uh, it's going to be like more in depth into that topic. We will cover. Uh, like what is behind the dot sort function that you use in the like your regular programming languages and um, what what algorithms are behind that what different complexities of algorithms can be um, you can kind of see there uh, yeah I'm pretty excited for that one as well yeah, yeah true <laughs> uh, me as well and uh, the last one will be dedicated to graphs as I mentioned earlier yeah so it will be fun. Uh, like to be honest, I adore graphs. So <laughs> yeah, hopefully. yeah. Then so the graphs it. one, the graphs one will be on Saturday. Uh, I believe it's March twenty seventh. Uh, so it's going to be like an odd one out, but we will announce it regardless. So you you all yeah. know when when it will be. Uh, any advice for data structures algorithms to review before interviews? Um, 
I can speak that like the most common ones, actually, that they are covered in this session. Like I think stacks, queues, um, heap is another one less, less common, but we didn't want to include it in this session, but it's also a nice one to know. Um, graphs and trees are definitely something uh, something you want to know. Definitely. Yeah, to be honest, like you should know as much as you can. Yeah. Um, it's like it adds value to you as a professional, as a programmer, right? So yeah, do your best, learn, <laughs> learn as much as you can. Yeah, but generally these are kind of uh, very common ones. Obviously, these are not all of them. Yeah, just part of uh, of the big picture what we cover right now yeah yeah uh, i'm a freshman right now any suggestions regarding algo i'm um, looking forward to work in dsc uh great to hear it um yeah like same we kind of covered different concepts uh and like these sessions are basically an introduction to your algorithms knowledge uh, from here, from these sessions, you probably want to go to some other resources and like look in depth. Try to code some of these data structures that we covered today, uh, because like for example, like JavaScript doesn't have a tree implementation or it doesn't have a queue implementation. Go and just try and code that on your own, uh, just from what you understood today. Uh, I think it's a pretty good exercise on its own. No. Yeah. Actually, Andrew mentioned Hacker Rank before, and uh, on YouTube they have like specific tutorials on how to code uh, like uh, different data structures. So it's not just uh, conceptual; it's more it's more like uh, coding and implementing. So yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> uh, <laughs> which language uh, uh, you guys will use? Great question. We will use JavaScript. Uh, yeah. The reason we are using JavaScript is probably because um, it's like closest. Well, for one, it's like almost the most popular one. Uh, I will have. I know people will disagree with me. I don't want to like go go into that direction, but. Uh, we will also maybe no promises given, but we might go into like visually displaying the algorithms. And the best language to use that, and the easiest one, in my opinion, is JavaScript because like the web the web browser can just render whatever you're writing um, in that language. Uh, it's like native to to the web browsers. Um, yeah, that's that's what we will be using. Yeah. Uh, the Discord link was pasted a couple of times in the chat. We can drop that again uh, and on the screens right now as well. Uh, yeah, I also noticed a couple of questions about regarding uh, our, if, if we are siblings, uh, we're definitely not related. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, a fun, fun fact, um, Alexander is living in the same apartment that I used to live in. So that's, here you go. That's That's the only, Thing we related on. True, and we are uh, we are studying at the same program, so <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, true, true. Well, there is yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, we I'm currently a, a co-op student um, taking my internship um, at a local company called Vehicle, uh, and Alexander will also be joining us quite soon. So that's that's very yeah. exciting. <laughs> So I don't know. Thanks everyone. This was this was amazing. I really enjoyed uh, I really enjoyed the session. And thanks everyone for the questions. This was awesome. Um, That's cool. <laughs> very excited to see you all in the next session. So yeah, it's Friday, same time, 6 p.m. EST. Um, feel free to join it next week. Yeah. Thanks everyone for coming. See you. See you then. <laughs> I'm inspired that there's so many people working to accomplish the same goal of creating a connected future. By having students lead clubs on campus directly supported by Google developers, that's the best way to reach out to students. It's really inspirational always to hear about members of the community who echo your values and echo your beliefs. I've been listening more than I've been speaking. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing because I'm, I'm just getting all these ideas. Google, it needs to reach a wider audience and be more relatable as a company. And I think Google is one of the brands that is very good at doing that.